So friends, please join me in welcoming my friend and colleague and classmate for the 2012 Leadership Atlanta class, our moderator, David Lewis. Well, I, I look forward to meeting this person that Peter described. Uh, um, no, I, I think um, just a couple of details. Um, um, I have spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and I think um, the reason I do these kinds of events is because when you talk about the conflict between the Israelis and, and their neighborhood, and the Palestinians in particular, um, I have uh, uh, spent a lot of time not only listening to the Israeli point of view and the American Jewish point of view, but I have spent a lot of time listening to the other point of view. Um, I did a documentary for Frontline about Hezbollah shortly after 9-11. Um, I did a documentary for CNN about how several countries, including Israel, how they fight terrorism. Uh, and I've done numerous other projects in the region um, and, and have a lot of familiarity with um, what the other side thinks and, and how they think it and why they think it. And I guess for that reason, I mean, I'm probably the only kind of Jewish Atlant Atlantan who takes his kids on vacation in Beirut. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, call me strange. Um, so my job here is really just to help these gentlemen talk to each other. Um, let me give you some brief bios on these two if you don't already know who they are. Um, Jeremy Ben-Ami is the president of J Street uh, and the founder. Uh, and he brings to the role both deep experience in American politics and government and a passionate commitment to the state of Israel. ben Ami's family connection to Israel goes back 130 years to the first Aliyah when his great-grandparents were among the first settlers in Petah Tikva. His grandparents were one of the founding families of Tel Aviv, and his father was an activist and leader in the Irgun, working for Israel's independence and on the rescue of European Jews before and during World War II. His political resume includes serving in the mid-1990s as the de Deputy Domestic Policy Advisor in the uh, Clinton White House, and he's also worked on seven presidential and numerous state and local campaigns. In the late 1990s, uh, uh, Jeremy lived in Israel, where he started a consulting firm working with Israeli nonprofits and politicians. He has a, a law degree from NYU and is a graduate of the Wildrow, Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Relations at <coughs> Princeton. Uh, Dr. Daniel Gordis, Gordis is the Senior Vice President and the Coret Distinguished Fellow at Shalem College in Jerusalem. He's a regular columnist for the Jerusalem Post and a frequent contributor to the New York Times, both in print and online. He's the author of many books, and he's uh, just going to give the plug. He's got a new one on Menachem Begin coming out next week. Um, uh, and he's a winner of the uh, National Jewish Book Award. Uh, Gordis was the founding dean of the Ziegler School of uh, Rabbinic Studies at the University of Judaism, the first rabbinical college on the uh, west coast of the U.S. He joined Shalem in 2007 to help found Israel's first liberal arts college after spending nine years as vice president of the Mandel Foundation in Israel and director of its Leadership Institute. Um, I could go on and on about both of these gentlemen, but I don't want to take time away from them. Here's the format. Uh, each gentleman is... Uh, is going to have 10 minutes to uh, state their point of view. And uh, starting with uh, Jeremy, I believe. Um, and then there will be a five minute rebuttal. This is going to be a, uh, a conversation, not a debate. Uh, gentlemen, um, I want this to be a clean fight. Uh, sorry, discussion. Uh, no below the belt arguments. No. Uh, so, so, and then uh, after they have five minutes to uh, rebut each other, um, I'll ask some questions, and then we'll get questions from you. You will see some cards on your uh, seats. Uh, please uh, fill your questions in, uh, hand them down to the end of the line, and we will collect them, and then we will ask uh, some of those questions. Uh, I don't think I need to say this, but don't hold back. <laughs> uh, microphones on, gentlemen. Jeremy? So good evening, and thank you, David. Thank you very much to Rabbi Siegel, to Rabbi Berg, also Rabbi Levinson here, who helped to put this evening together. I want to thank the leaderships of both uh, Temple Sinai and the Temple for putting this event together. I also want to quickly thank the J Street leadership here in Atlanta, uh, Dotan Harpak and uh, Kirk Dornbush and others who lead a 
chapter of J Street that has about 1,500 people here in the Atlanta area, and also uh, our staff, Scott Brockman and Shira Frank, uh, who are here this evening. So thank you to all of them. Thanks, Danny, uh, for being here. Both of us are just off a red eye uh, from Israel in the last 24, 48 hours, and so you'll have to forgive us both a little bit if we begin to go a little off on tangents at times. Um, I know that it is unlikely that I will persuade Danny of my point of view or the other way around tonight, um, but I do hope that by engaging in this conversation in the spirit that was laid out with respect and with integrity, uh, that perhaps we can advance the understanding of those who are here tonight, those who are watching live stream, and show that these kinds of conversations are to be encouraged and not feared throughout the American Jewish community. And I'd also like to suggest at the outset that I think we should be able to stipulate to at least one shared point of agreement, and that is that we both care ever so deeply about the state of Israel and about the Jewish people. What we both want and what we are working for is a safe, a secure, and a thriving Israel that serves as the national homeland of the Jewish people and upholds the best of Jewish and democratic values. And I think we share that uh, as a goal. We may disagree exactly on how to get there, but I think we can demonstrate that we can do that without questioning each other's motives or our commitments either to the state of Israel or to the Jewish people. So in my brief opening, I would like to make five opening points. The first is a very simple proposition, and perhaps it's also one that we can agree on, and that is that the only solution to the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians in the land of Israel is a two-state solution. And achieving that is the only way in the long run that Israel can remain both Jewish and democratic. With roughly even numbers of Jews and non-Jews already living in the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, dividing the land into two nation states for two peoples is the only way to ensure that Israel isn't gonna have to be forced to choose between giving everyone who lives in that land equal rights and thereby becoming a binational state without a Jewish character, or denying large numbers of non-Jews their rights and thereby abandoning democracy. Every prime minister since Yitzhak Rabin and even Bibi Netanyahu today has come to accept that the two-state solution is an existential necessity for a Jewish and a democratic Israel. It's an argument today that isn't coming just from the left, it's coming from the sons and the daughters of the right. People like Tzipi Livni, the current lead negotiator, the former Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, Dan Meridor, people who are the sons and the daughters of the companions of Menachem Begin, about whom uh, Danny is writing. It's coming from the large numbers of figures from Israel's security establishment, like the six living directors of the Shin Bet in the movie The Gatekeepers, former directors of the Mossad and commanders of the IDF. So that's the first point. The second is something I hope we can also agree on, which is there is no one state solution to this conflict. One state, in fact, is not a solution, it's the problem. A nightmare, in fact, of ongoing conflict between the Jewish and the Palestinian people for sovereignty and control. There are one-staters on the right, and there's one-staters on the left. On the right, Naftali Bennett and the settler party that he leads argues that Israel should annex the West Bank, give in some case limited rights to those who live there, and win the demographic race by having more babies and encouraging you to make Aliyah. On the left, home today to the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, there's support for the return of five million Palestinian refugees and their descendants to Israel and the establishment of a binational democratic state. In either vision, Israel doesn't remain both Jewish and democratic. I don't think, Danny, that you fall into the one state camp, and perhaps you'll join me tonight in making the case to our audience that the idea that there is a one state solution should be fought by all those who believe that the state of Israel is and must be the national home of the Jewish people. So that leads me to my third point. I don't see any third way between a two-state solution and a one-state nightmare. 
I don't believe that Israel has the option of not making a choice and simply managing the conflict and maintaining the status quo. I think Danny, if I, we've talked and we've read each other's material enough, Danny's likely to argue that it's naive to believe that there is a way to reach a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I'm going to argue that it's Danny who's being naive in thinking that Israel can maintain the status quo indefinitely, occupying the territory that it won in 1967, denying the Palestinians who live there equal rights, and somehow avoiding international isolation, growing boycotts, and pariah status. The great danger right now is that those arguing against making a deal with the Palestinians are not being forced to argue for maintaining the status quo, and most importantly, they're not being asked to own the consequences of inaction. Israel is facing growing isolation in the international community, in part because of inherent anti-Semitism, but also because the world is losing patience with the way, the ongoing way that Israel is treating the Palestinian people. And let me be clear, Israel is far from the world's worst actor. There are dozens of places around the world with human rights violations far worse than what is going on today on the West Bank. But while that situation cannot be and shouldn't be compared to what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Sudan, in Tibet, the Congo, the list goes on and on, what's happening to Palestinians today is offensive, not just to the world's conception of human rights, but to the very Jewish principles of how to treat another people. So this leads me to my fourth point, perhaps the most essential point, and that is, at this moment in time, friends of Israel should be offering their full support to Secretary of State John Kerry and his intensive effort to resolve the conflict and to reach a two-state solution. I'm sure, Danny, that you'll have some choice words, uh, having a rather derisive view of Secretary Kerry and of J Street, for that matter, uh, as typical Americans who are starry-eyed optimists who believe there are solutions to all the problems facing the world, including this one. I plead guilty to the charge. I do believe that this conflict has a solution and that there is a partner today in President Abbas on the Palestinian side. I would argue that my optimism and willingness to test that possibility, the possibility of resolving this conflict, is far better than pessimism that says there is no way forward, that there are only problems and there are no solutions. I would argue that such an attitude is inconsistent with Zionism itself. The first wave of immigrants in the first Aliyah didn't sit in Russia and Eastern Europe and recount all the reasons why their quixotic venture to Ottoman Palestine in the 19th century was unlikely to succeed. They acted and they bent the course of history. Danny, as you have written yourself, in the future Israel is likely only to have choices that are for, far worse than those we have today. So why shouldn't Friends of Israel, like Kerry and J Street, encourage movement towards a compromise that stands at least a chance of working? It's far better than maintaining a status quo that we know will not work. I believe that those like Danny who argue that there is nothing that can be done need to bear the burden of proving their case that maintaining the status quo is less risky than taking action. Finally, I want to turn for one moment to the state of the American Jewish conversation about these difficult issues. And I want to offer a very clear proposition that it is not only right for Jewish Americans who care deeply about the state of Israel to participate in this conversation and express their opinions, it is vital for the health of the American Jewish community. Look, I recognize that not everyone in this room, for sure, uh, or in the American Jewish community is going to agree with me and what I'm saying, and frankly, not everyone is going to agree with Danny. I also recognize that one way some of these folks deal with the arguments I'm presenting is to question my right and my standing to make these arguments in the first place. 
you don't live in Israel, your kids don't serve in the army, you're not paying taxes, you don't go to the cafes that blow up or ride the buses. I know all that, and those statements are true. The decisions will have to be made by you, Danny, and the people who live in Israel who will be directly affected. But if Israel is to be the national homeland of all the Jewish people, if I am to have some stake in its future and its survival as a Jewish non-citizen, and if Israel is going to ask me to represent it in Washington, D.C., to lobby, to ask me for money and for support, to ask me to send my children on birthright so they establish a connection, you can't ask me to keep my opinions to myself and to only speak out if I agree with every last policy of the government of Israel. Frankly, I don't agree with every policy of my own government, and I'm sure that you don't agree with every policy of the Netanyahu government in Israel. But I'm not suggesting that you should remain quiet about your conflicts with this government or that, and neither should I. The question of whether there should be any rules and limits around this Jewish communal conversation, who should be in the tent and who out, what types of speech should not be allowed, is front and center in the American Jewish community today. Every time I turn around, every day, there's a new story about an author or a speaker being barred from a Jewish communal event and institution. It's something that you in Atlanta know all too well about after Peter Byart's aborted talk at the book festival last year. So my final point is that we make a tremendous mistake when we seek to put limits on speech and debate within the American Jewish community. Those who try to shut down voices they don't agree with aren't demonstrating the strength of the Jewish community, they are admitting their fear of what's being said. The best antidote for speech we don't like, it's often said, is other speech. Particularly in the Jewish community, our tradition of debate and dialogue should be respected and recognized as a source of strength and learning. So in that spirit, I look forward to the rest of this evening and to continuing this important discussion. Thank you. I also want to uh, thank everyone here for the gracious welcome and the wonderful invitation to be here. I want to thank David for moderating and the rabbis of the various congregations for the invitation to me and Jeremy. It's a great honor to be here and a uh, delight to be back in the States. I also want to thank Jeremy uh, for making my argument as well as his. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, I just got off the plane from Tel Aviv this morning and another flight to Atlanta. I was worried I'd be a little bit tired, have a lot of work ahead of me, but my colleague has simply told you what it is that I'm going to say. So I'm going to sit down and let you ask questions. <laughs> I come from a smaller country and a poorer country, so I only have three points to make. <laughs> it's true. The first point that I want to make is, uh, well, the first preamble is that I think Jeremy's right. We agree about a lot. Neither of us are one-staters. He is not the extreme left. He is not BDS. I am not the extreme right. I am not Naftali Bennett. We are both somewhere in the middle. Uh, but we do disagree about some important things, some of which he um, accidentally failed to mention among his five points, but I will try to help revive his memory on just a few of them. But let me say, first of all, the, three, the basic three points, and then um, I will use my extra two minutes that were kindly given to me by the moderator because of the difference in our understanding of what 10 minutes is, uh, to, uh, to make the additional point that I, um, that, that, I was, that I think comes up in light of what Jeremy was saying. The first point is this. We both actually agree that we want a two-state solution. We both agree that we would like, at the end of the day, for there to be a Jewish, democratic Israel living alongside a democratic, liberal, by liberal I mean freedom of religion, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and so forth, Palestine. Where we disagree, and Jeremy already told you, uh, is that he thinks it's possible in the short run or even the medium run, and I don't. Not Every problem, no matter how critical it may be, has a solution. Not every problem has a solution. Walk into an oncology unit. Not every problem has a solution. In Kashmir, there's no solution, but there's quiet. In the former Yugoslavia, there's no solution, but there's quiet. 
That's not the ideal. I'll come back to that in a second. But as much as Jeremy and I think desperately want the same thing, it doesn't mean that just because we want it, it can be made to happen. Now, we also disagree, I think, very strongly about what the reason for that is. Jeremy said that I don't agree with everything that the Netanyahu government does. I, I find that unbelievable that he would say such a thing. Uh, but of course it's true. Right? I, I don't know anybody, including Bibi Netanyahu, actually, who agrees with everything. No, that's actually not a joke. Bibi Netanyahu was forced to do all sorts of things he really doesn't want to do. So even Bibi Netanyahu doesn't agree with everything the Netanyahu government does. And I'm a huge critic of the Netanyahu government. But let's be very clear about why, at the end of the day, in 2014, we don't have an agreement. The Israelis are not sugar and spice and all things nice, and I would not want to have to negotiate with us. We're a pretty unruly bunch. But here's the difference. In the early 1970s, Golda Meir, when the Palestinians were beginning to press more and more and more for their national aspirations, said derisively, and you can even find an article like this in the outfit page of the New York Times online, you can just go search for it, but she said not, not uncommonly, Eze am Palestinai, or in her little American Milwaukee accent, you know, Eze am Palestinai, which means what Palestinian people? Left-wing, labor minister, Golda Meir, the darling of the left, said, what Palestinian people are you talking about? And Bibi Netanyahu, the right-wing maniacal, whatever as he's portrayed, went to Bar Ilan University last year in 2013, spoke about the Palestinian people, spoke about the need for a Palestinian state, and said that he wants there to be a two-state solution. Now, you can believe him, you cannot believe him, whatever. That's what he said. The Israeli needle has moved dramatically over the course of the last four decades. There is nobody, yes, there's Naftali Bennett's, and it's going to be a cold day in you know where when he gets elected prime minister without changing his positions. He might get elected prime minister, but not with these positions, by the way. But there is no Israeli major national leader, certainly no prime minister in many decades, who is denied that there is a Palestinian people that has legitimate national aspirations, and it was in more, more recent years not actually said there ought to be a two-state solution, a Jewish democratic Israel alongside a democratic Palestine. That's how much the Israeli needle has changed. How much has the Palestinian needle changed, though? I want to remind you that the PLO was formed not in 1967 when the territories that Jeremy is talking about were occupied. The PLO was formed in 1964 before the Six-Day War, before there were any territories to ask for. The Palestinians decided that they were going to embark on their campaign to destroy Israel for their own liberation long before the territories were occupied. And just last week, Abbas said once again in the New York Times, so it must be true, <laughs> Abbas said in the New York Times, Recognizing Israel as a Jewish state is, and I quote, completely out of the question. My friends, all you need is really my first point. But my ride to the airport isn't until tomorrow morning, so I will say just a few more. But that's the bottom line. The Israeli needle has moved tremendously. The Palestinian needle has not. I'm not suggesting that the Israelis are always smart. I'm not suggesting that every little settlement that goes up in the middle of nowhere is a smart idea. It's a stupid idea. And there's lots of things that the Israelis do that make no sense. But the fundamental reason that there is not an agreement is because we are still fighting the war of independence. The war that supposedly ended in 1949 is still going on. Israelis are still waiting for the day for our neighbors to say, we are indigenous, and you are indigenous. We have a right to be here, and you have a right to be here. You have never heard a Palestinian leader say that. Certainly not in Arabic to his or her, but really his, population. When you do, we'll be in a different ballgame. But until you hear that, and you have not, there's really not very much to talk to. Point number two, not talk about. Point number two. If point number one was that the reason that we're still locked in the conflict is because the Palestinians have not moved their needle while the Israelis have, the second point that I want to make is that here's where Jeremy was just a tiny bit off vector in terms of where I think we really disagree. J Street, as you know, was founded not to advocate for a two-state solution and to get, to, Ameri to get Americans to buy I love John Kerry buttons. I have one. You can have it for free. J Street was founded to pressure Israel into making concessions. 
It was founded to go to Capitol Hill and to work with specific congressmen and congresswomen, senators and other various national representatives to try to get them to move the needle for Israel. That, I suggest to you, is not only unfair, but it's actually very unwise. It's unwise because as long as the Palestinians know that Europe and even many of American Jews actually under, believe that the way to bring this conflict to an end is to put the pressure on Israel, the more the Palestinians understand there's no reason to make an accommodation. Their position, Jeremy's absolutely right, Israel is being ostracized. Jeremy's absolutely right, Israel is more and more alone. Jeremy is absolutely right, Israel is feeling increasing pressure every single day. The Palestinians get it. They read the New York Times, they write op-eds for the New York Times. And so they say, as long as people are having conversations like this tonight, and there's this guy, this very committed American Jew who knows a lot about Israel, is there a lot, et cetera, et cetera, and he's going to pressure Congress to pressure Israel, why should we possibly change? The problem that the world faces is that nobody is actually saying to the Palestinians, when you stop executing people, especially women, for having sex outside of marriage, literally, when you stop jailing people for posting a Facebook thing about Mahmoud Abbas, when you stop jailing your political opponents, and when you start speaking about Israel as a rightful participant in the life of the Middle East, then you're going to have all of our support. And until you change, until you behave that we expect Israel to behave and America to behave and England to behave and France to behave, there's no conversation. If that were to be said to the Palestinians, there would be pressure on them to join the liberal democratic community of nations in a way that they are not doing precisely because they are being coddled. So my first point is that there's not going to be a solution to this conflict at any time in the near future because the Palestinians' needle has not moved the way the Israeli needle has. The second point that I'm trying to make is that I think part of the problem and what's dangerous about this idea that you have to pressure Israel to make accommodations is that it only encourages the Palestinians to dig their feet in th further. The third point is this. Just because I think that there's not an immediate solution to this terribly anguishing problem, and I'm not at all belittling the nature of the problem, and I agree with Jeremy completely, there are things that happen on the West Bank that are really not okay. There are also incredibly great people who live on the West Bank. You may be aware that this Soda Stream, by the way, company that everybody wants to boycott, employs mostly Palestinians. The vast majority of people that are employees are Palestinians, and you shut down SodaStream, you're going to have several hundred Palestinians who support their families without jobs. Complicate, the situation is infinitely more complicated than people sometimes want to pretend. But my third point is this. Just because there may not be a solution to the problem doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about what to do. I don't think there's going to be any great White House lawn signing. There's going to be no declaration of the end of the conflict. Not in your lifetime, not in my lifetime, not in the lifetime of the few college students from Emory who I know who are here. This conflict, sadly, is not going to end any time soon. So therefore, our responsibility is to ask, what can we do to make the lives of the Palestinians on the West Bank easier? What can we do to make Israelis feel more secure? How can we take a genuinely bad situation, which is not going to bet to be a good situation, but make it less bad? The problem with every single president sending his, and soon probably his or her, emissary over to the Middle East to do it yet once again, is that we keep working for the grand solution, which is never going to come, and therefore, we don't have the really important conversation, which is, since that grand solution is not going to happen and there's going to be no signing on the White House lawn, what can we do? What can we do now in February and soon in March and during the summer and next fall? What can we actually do to make the lives of Palestinians better? Because we're working towards the one grand solution, we hardly ever talk about that. I think we'd have a much more productive and a much more useful conversation, therefore, if we remembered those three things, which I will repeat very quickly and then conclude. The first is that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict will come to an end when the Palestinians publicly, in Arabic, say the Jews are just as indigenous to this region as we are. Therefore, in a highly contested land, we are going to split it with them. 
and we are then going to declare openly and permanently that the conflict is over. Abbas is not willing to say that. Second, it does not help the Palestinian people to pressure Israel because the Palestinian people are being oppressed much more by their own leadership than by Israeli leadership. If Europe and America said to the Palestinians, be democratic, stop jailing people, stop killing Christians, stop killing women who don't live their lives intimately, etc., however you want them to do, the Palestinian people would be better off. Third, the minute we stop focusing on a prize that unfortunately can't be achieved now and start focusing on much more immediate issues as to how can we help the Palestinians live better lives tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year, I think we will have all done a great service to the Palestinians and the Jews who share the region and to a world which is, of course, obviously very, very much engaged with how that region progresses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.